This is Rupert Hugeworth, founder of Huren Report. His list of China's wealthiest always creates a PR storm. Some love it, some hate it. I've probably been sent about 200 legal letters saying we're going to take it to court and fortunately touch wood, nobody has succeeded yet. Basically, if we can prove that you're on the list, you're on it. I Born in Luxembourg, Rupert came to China over 10 years ago. There's a Chinese saying that humans don't want to become famous in the same way that pig, pigs don't want to get fat. Because the fatter you are as a pig, the more likely you are to be of great um, you know, sort of potential for the, the dinner table. From his perspective, how has China changed? And who will be the next richest person in China? Rupert, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Yes, Thank this you. is going to be a great topic for our audience because they're very interested in China's richest people, and that's exactly what you're in the business of yes. doing. Tell me about the Huren Report. I started this company about 15 years ago, and the idea behind this was to try and tell the story of the people, the stories of the people making modern China, especially from a business point of view. Established in 1999, Huren Report currently produces 20 magazine issues a year made up of a monthly, main book, and supplements that target the special interests of China's wealth creators. The flagship Huren Report magazine is published monthly and reaches the households of about 100,000 proven wealthy Chinese individuals and their advisors. Tell me about your business model. How has that changed over the past 15 years? I mean, years? my business model changed it dramatically. Yeah. So when I first started, I was uh, basically started by selling my list to other people's magazines. And, you know, I'd be paid one US dollar, say, per word, which is quite good. But when you're doing a list, right. there's not that many words yeah. anyway. Right. So it wasn't very successful as a business. And pretty much, you know, I was, uh, I was running out of money. So I created a media, and I call it Huron Report. And, and the, this, this media has been the mainstay of our business. So Huron Report Inc. today has got three or four business lines. One, you've got, I've got four magazines, and we get advertising revenue from that. We do a lot of events. And one of our secrets, again, though it's obviously not a secret because I'm on television talking about it, but one of the, the secrets that we have is that we do a lot of events with these entrepreneurs. So it's not just that we write about these people. We actually invite them to our events. So we can say, I can say that in the last, say, eight months, 100 of the 1,000 on our rich list have been through my doors at my events. And what do they do there? Or who pays for those events? And that would be sponsored by Sponsors. banks or okay. cars or luxury brands or whoever it is that wants to reach out and talk, sell their products and services to this group of people, really luxury property as well. We have about 120 people based around China head office in Shanghai with offices in Beijing, Guangzhou, Chengdu, and Sanya, and Xiamen. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have our sort of footprint. But the next challenge is how to take it up to, you know, with the, 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 the revolution that's going on in the media and to be able to commercialize it. So, you know, we can feel confident that if you've got access to these people and you're inviting them to your events, that's clearly not going to change. But people's reading habits and media habits are changing dramatically. And so we've got to keep up with that. And that's something that you know, spending is costing me a lot of time. You've seen China from an early perspective. Yes, okay. I, mean, I, I came in 1990 to study um, Chinese one year in Beijing, and then I came back in 97 for two years to um, work for Arthur Anderson as uh, an accountant. You'd see all these changes that were happening, people wearing colorful clothes suddenly. But then who was the people making those clothes? And who was the people, you know, sort of designing them, if you like, coming up with that? Then also you come into the cities and you see all these new buildings coming up. You know, where I was at university in Beijing, which is Haidian district, and the, it's, the landscape has completely changed. And I suppose, again, the question is that who's behind these buildings? The stories of these people tell the story of modern China. So originally you wanted to find out really the faces behind the changes. In 1999, it was the 50th anniversary of China as well. So there were a lot of sort of political reports going out about the changes that are happening in China. But I guess what I was looking for is that is the true story of business in China. It's none of this sort of political this, political that. It is these people have made it. Their stories of first break, second break. How do you find the financials on those first 50? Well, it's a cross-checking work. So going to the libraries, you'd sift through 10 years or so of all these different newspaper reports. 
And then you'd find that, for example, when Jiang Zemin went to visit Sichuan province, on the front cover of the People's Daily was a photograph of him shaking the hand of a well-known local entrepreneur. Now, my theory was that if Jiang Zemin is on the front cover with a private entrepreneur, that private entrepreneur must be worth his salt. So you'd write down his name. And then, there, for example, Clinton came to Shanghai, and he had in 97, 98, and there's photographs of him having lunch with a group of successful Shanghai entrepreneurs with the Shanghai mayor. Now, again, anybody, in my opinion, who has been given that, that, point, right? that, who's been given that honor must be people worthy of writing down their names. So I'd write down all these names, and then basically it was a cross-checking work. So you might find out that he sold, you know, sort of 500 units of property last year, or he, he distributed X number of cars, or whatever it was. There'd be some numbers around that. And in some cases, you'd even get you know, his sales and his profit figures, and you could sort of extrapolate the wealth. But in the first year, I didn't actually come up with a physical wealth number. I actually basically ranked people between A, B, C. A was sort of more than 100 million US, B was sort of 50 to 100 million, and then C was sort of 5 to 50 million or something. And these were all just based on the news reports because we didn't have the internet so it much was, back there, then. There wasn't really an internet, internet to refer to. Right. It was news reports and also just cold analysis. And what is interesting is you look at that top 50 today, I reckon there's still about 30 people from that list who are on we're our list today. We're now on the fuller list. Yeah. So we're not completely miles off. Okay, so originally this was a personal hobby of sorts, wasn't it, to, to compile the list, or personal interest? Yes, it was a personal interest. And it was, for me, I'd studied Chinese history I found it extremely confusing to understand modern Chinese history because of all the political changes that were going on. And this is a way of actually understanding at least the business angle in a very clear-cut way. You've got the 50 people who've made the most, at least in public. By the end of the tour, Rupert found that he had great confidence in his findings. So he made a strategic choice to resign from the accounting firm Arthur Anderson and concentrate all of his time and energy into compiling China's ever-changing rich list. Recent history has shown that the business model of rich lists works very well, especially in days when everybody aspires to become wealthier. In the original list of the 50, what industries were most? The, the key source of wealth would have been um, residential property. So these are developers who had gone out who were realized they managed to get their hands on a plot of land and they developed it and they sold it. They made money overnight. And even when you wind back to today, and you look at the top 1,000, because we've expanded this from 100 people to 1,000 people over the last few years, and the top 1,000, number one, number two, real estate is still one of the top two. And that's basically on the back of urbanization. So the mega trend that has created all this wealth is that you've got these um, 500 million people moving in from the countryside to the cities. They need place to live, place to work, place to go shopping. The second mega trend, if you like, that has sort of created a lot of wealth has been the IT boom. And that's sort of been a global boom because, you know, it was all brand new. So real estate, that's one, also IT. IT. These are the and things. And then the you other saw. one would okay. you could argue is manufacturing. Because the whole concept of made in China versus created in China is at least for the last twenty years, the export market has been driven by, you know, these great manufacturers. You've got like higher. Lenovo, these brands, you know, perhaps in those days they were like tiny. Today they're really quite significant they're going players global, sure. and top of their field anywhere in the world, not just in China. And this is one of the exciting things of watching my job at any rate, is you see these companies that 10 years ago, perhaps they were a little player in their province, grown to become a big player in their province, in their country, in their industry globally. On one hand, the rich list may bring fame and publicity. But on the other hand, statistics show that 48 of the 1,330 people who have appeared on the list have suffered adverse fortunes. The most well-known case might be that of Huang Guangyu, founder of appliances chain store Guomei. He was ranked the richest man in China three times. However, Mr. Huang was sentenced to jail due to stock market manipulation and bribery. Let's go back to your list and look at some of the early lists that you created. I know that some people criticized the early list and said that those that were on it experienced bad luck for being on it, or perhaps they were scrutinized under the microscope, yeah. otherwise they wouldn't have been. Tell me about the people who want to be on your list and the ones who don't. 
There's a Chinese saying that humans don't want to become famous in the same way that pig, pigs don't want to get fat. Because the fatter you are as a pig, the more likely you are to be of great um, you know, sort of potential for the, the dinner table. There's a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs who made their money perhaps in a slightly gray area, and they are terrified of being publicized. Then you've got those people who've been successful, just pure in itself. And they just, you know, it's just ma fun. It's just trouble, you know, having your name out there. There might be personal security issues. There might be, um, you know, sort of all these different government departments that might want to come and do more investigations because you're obviously got lots of money and you could pay quite a lot. And your taxes lot. are at this level, right? Yeah. And, and, and then you have those people who just prefer to stay discreet. My overall um, conclusion is this. So the first generation entrepreneur, generally speaking, is, is proud of what they've done and, and wants to talk about it. But they have a conflict. And their conflict is that you don't want to show off. So in a society like China, where you're a big society, you don't really want to show off too much. Because if you show off too much, well, then you'll get more investigations, you'll get more competition, because they'll work out the secret of your success. My Chinese friends will always say to me, Chinese are, are very discreet with their wealth. And I, I would totally agree. I'd say that they want to be very discreet. But in their heart of hearts, I don't think they are. They're buying more luxury products than anybody else in the world. They're buying more Rolls Royces than anywhere else in the world. They're buying more private jets than anywhere else in the world. And this is not super discreet people acting super discreetly. No, these are people who are forced to be discreet almost. They don't want to show their public, the public the, their wealth. But in their heart of hearts, they're extremely proud of their success. On the one hand, it's great, you know, compared to 10 or 15 years ago when you might have had companies that don't want to be on the list. Well, I mean, those companies, mm -hmm. the right. companies these are the ones who would be. Yeah. What? So the ones that don't want to be on the list, well, can they, they tend to be the shady guys. Okay, and can they opt out? Can no, they say there is no opt out? There is no opt out. So, so you will list them if. So they long as that we, I mean, the, the, the way we compile the list, mm -hmm. and is stock, mm -hmm. so stock market of listed companies. You get sure. a lot of data there, yeah. but there's a lot more data out there if you know where to look. You know in um, members associations, in business associations, and so on and so forth. So we would take publicly available data only. If you qualify for the top 1,000, you're on the list. I've probably been sent about 200 legal letters saying we're going to take you to court. And fortunately, touch wood, nobody has succeeded yet. Basically, if we can prove that you're on the list, you're on it. There's two cases where we, we find that we fight quite hard. One is where you get somebody who's got basically shady money, and they really don't they want don't to want be the, the recognition and right. are on the list because as soon as they're on the list, they're effectively going to get themselves arrested. And then the second lot are those perhaps whose true situation is not what it appears to be. I've had a guy who really approached me. His name is the owner of the listed company. He has got a listed company in Hong Kong. And he then comes to me and says, actually, it's not really me who's the owner of this company. And uh, actually, there's, I'm one of He's nine a, people. I'm holding the shares on behalf of other people who can't be named. Therefore, you don't put me on the list. And I was going, like, no, that doesn't quite work. I mean, your name's on the list actually, of company. that's the name that should be on the list, right? And <laughs> unless you have done it, you've obviously filed incorrectly with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So, I mean, clearly, you're illegal in that sense. So, no, we, we stick his name down, and, and that's be done with it, you know. Strong research capability is the major competence for the Huren Report. They have a dedicated team to monitor the daily ups and downs of the market. Uh, Uh,可能包括一些公共信息的研究啊,包括股价啊,然后年报,可能还有一些行业分析这样子的一些研究,然后平时的话可能会做一些实地的调研,包括采访一些企业家。企业家的话我们可能会跟他主要集中在呃他
实际接触到巴塔本人的话，他像在吃啊、穿啊什么，基本上都没有任何很奢侈的这种东西，吃饭可能就一碗面就搞定了这样。Let's talk about the accuracy of the numbers. How do you guarantee that? Well, I mean, the accuracy of the numbers. I mean, you as a reader, you should feel confident that the numbers that you see are at least number. The published numbers. The, the, the numbers that we put down is what we can see. So I often use the analogy of an iceberg. You know,、um, what you can see at the top is only a very small part of the total picture. We estimate the proportion to be on our rich list is like one to two. For every one person we found, we've missed two people. I had an, a, a top entrepreneur, Charles Chang from Sohu. Who once joked to me and said, that, "How, Rupert? How do you know what I've got outside my listed company?" And I said, "Actually, I don't. You know, every now and again, I might be able to find a little report saying that Charles just bought a, a yacht or a famous house,、um, but that's it." So this is an ongoing job. If you have a thousand people on your list, you're constantly having to update and, and look at the numbers, number crunch, yeah, but, so to speak. But the secret that it's not just about a rich list. If we were just doing a rich list, that's very one-dimensional. What we have is we have a, a philanthropy list. So we would look at the most generous individuals, and very often that would feed us, feed into our rich list. So by doing a philanthropy list, we're actually looking at the number of people who donated most in the last year, perhaps to universities, perhaps to disaster relief. But if you find somebody's made a donation of, let's say, 10 million US, suddenly you think, well, this guy should probably be on our rich list.、Right. So you would, that would feed, that would be a very good feeder for our rich list. We also do another list, which has been very successful, called the brands list, the most valuable brands in China. And there's a very funny story here because, you know, I went to Wenzhou once about, or about six, seven years ago, to ask these Wenzhouese, say, that, you know, we're doing the rich list. Can you tell us how big your businesses are?、And、they go, Oh, Rupert, tiny. Oh, we have really terrible business. You know, or、I、no know profit at all. <laughs> And you can't get anything to corroborate this、uh, to show that they're actually making a lot of money. So basically, in that year, on our rich list, the Wenzhouese were all really lowly,、right. you know, right down the bottom, if 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 on the list at all. And then I took the brands list. The, a lot of the Wenzhouese in 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 clothes or textiles, and、um, actually have some very famous brands, shoes. They're doing some very very famous brands. And so I'd say to them, you know, well, according to what you told me last year, you made no money. Therefore, your business can't be worth much. Therefore, your brand is worth nothing. And, and then they had a huge argument. You, I was supposed to do a television show and live broadcast the brands list in Wenzhou that day. The local government had been put under pressure by the lo by local entrepreneurs to say no. This must be pulled because our brands are worth significantly more than what he's suggesting. And basically, was that when we were doing the rich list, they had underestimated. But when we came to doing the, the, the most valuable Chinese brands list, that's well, where they're going to be ranked. That、yeah. is really important for their business. You know, they can't be seen to be a tiny a brand. brand. They've got to be a bigger brand. And so they would probably overcompensate on that one. So on our rich list, the next year, all the the Wenzhouese were right up there. Right. And、so、we got a much more accurate representation. And I think that's sort of the stories of what, you know, it's not just a one-dimensional rich list that we're doing. We're doing. A rich list. We're doing a philanthropy list. We're looking at brands list. We have various other sort of lists that we put out. Now, Hu Run is more than the name of a rich list. In the past few years, they have also launched a philanthropy list, a most valuable brands list, an art list, and others. Apart from the periodical Hu Run Report, the company has other magazines like Hu Run Horse and Polo, Schools Guide. As well as wings and water. So whenever I put out a new list, we do lots of new reports and lots of new lists. We probably put out about twenty or thirty a year, and we would always sort of step one is who are your readers, and who are we looking to write our list for, if you like. There are a lot of other lists out there. The most valuable list or most famous. And list in the world, in my opinion, is the Fortune 500. You know, and I was very jealous of that list because I know it's not this simple. But basically, it's the top 500 listed companies in the world、um, measured by their sales. But you know, basically, they're just taking the sales numbers and then ranking them. And, and every government wants to know that data. Whereas what we do is much more complex, in my opinion, because you're、deeper. dealing with wealth,、right. and, and it's very much on a personal level. Yes. And in China. 
everybody wants to make money. Basically, you have to be older than 16 and younger than 80. <laughs> so there's a huge interest, which is way beyond what I would say the developed country interest in rich lists, in the rich list here in China. Next time you take an airplane flying out of China, look at the news agents. And the first row of books are all about how to make money. You know, how I did it by Jack Ma, how I did it by a number of these very famous Chinese entrepreneurs, what lessons of secrets of success and of Li ka and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, they're all up there, front row. Now, when you go to Britain or the US, basically the front row of the, the news agent is all celebrity culture. <laughs> celebrity it's culture the celebrity or culture, where you go on vacation. Entertainment. Right. Very good example of how people here are really desperate to study and learn about how to build businesses. It's the most exciting place in the world for entrepreneurship today. Hurun isn't the only company that publishes a China rich list. International media, like Forbes, also compile their own rich lists for this booming economy. The different compiling methods affect different results. Take Zongqing Ho as an example. In 2012, he ranked number one on both lists. But on Hurun's rich list, his wealth was set at 80 billion RMB, while on the Forbes list, his estimated worth was 63 billion. Some analysts say that China is now a pyramid, of course, with the top tier being the, the number one tier cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, yeah. Guangzhou. And as you move down, there's treasure at the bottom of the sea. How do you see that in your list with the people in your list being from other provinces, smaller towns and cities? On our rich list, 41% come from first tier cities, which are the four first cities, cities of Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou and Shenzhen. About another third come from what we would call second tier cities, which are basically the capitals of each province, plus a few other cities. And then the rest come from the countryside. So about 36%, I think, from my numbers, come from so-called third tier cities and the rest, if you like. Do you predict that mm. will increase in the, in and, the next and Unfortunately, years? that will not increase. That will definitely decrease. And the decreased reason is very simple, is that once you've made a certain amount of money, you want to live in a bigger city. The, the attractiveness, the infrastructure, the education. Take the northwest, northeast of China, the three provinces of, of Heilongjiang, Jilin, Liaoning. You know, the, the number of rich lists on my list has decreased in the last few years. Not because these guys have fallen off the list. Making less money. They've actually moved themselves to Beijing. Right. So an example would be Dalian Wanda Group, which is a very famous uh, property developer. You know, they started out in Liaoning province in, in Dalian, but now their head office is in Beijing. So the chairman is no longer, could you say, that he is a Dalian-based person. So minus one for Dalian, plus one for Beijing. And so th that trend of what we're seeing of these, these third and second tier cities keeping these people is extremely difficult because they're all, by definition, being attracted into the top cities. But we are very lucky here in China compared with, say, India, where 70% of the India rich list live in Mumbai, one city, whereas in China it is still very spread out, you know, between north, east, south, west. As the first generation entrepreneurs in China become older, their successors emerge. Some of their successors are the second generation of the previous CEOs, while others are professional managers who have worked their way to the top. What do you think of all these companies where the new second generations are taking over? Uh, after 15 years in the business here, you're seeing the retirement of the entrepreneurs. What will well, I mean, there's not many retirements going on at the moment. I mean, the average age on the rich list is 53, so if you work backwards, they're born 1960. And if you wanted a quick demographic of that, that means their child is probably just coming out of university today. So if you're 53, you probably got a sort of a 22, 25-year-old. In terms of actual retirement, there's very few that are going on at the moment. So the first generation is not going to hand over en, for, en masse to the second generation for another 20 years. But there are a couple of interesting dynamics that are worth bringing to the attention here. One dynamic is that 80% of these entrepreneurial classes are looking to send their children to study overseas. It's unbelievably high. In Japan, you're probably dealing with 10%. India, 50%. In China, 80%, that's 8 0%. At the super rich level, it's up to 90% levels. What this means is that all these top entrepreneurs are sending their children to study in the US and the UK being the top two. Canada being right up there, Switzerland being fast up and growing, and they're looking to send their children to study overseas for 
I think a number of reasons. One is they recognize that these entrepreneurs, that the world, that China is going to be a much more global player in the next 20 years. And secondly, is that they're trying to sort of broaden the horizons of their children so that, you know, at a Prepare relatively young business. age, okay. they can actually interact with, you know, and they've seen a lot more than just, you know, sort of locally. The average age nowadays to send their children, I think it's now about 17. Yeah. So they can do two years overseas before, uh, two years prep almost, if you like, before getting into hopefully a good university. And that good university basically is Harvard, Yale, MIT, Oxford, Cambridge. I mean, that's the target. The top, yeah. So what you're seeing is that the second generation is being very much groomed for um, taking on the parents' business. That basically they're being sent to the US and the UK as of today. They are then being asked to study finance and accounting. <laughs> and then when they get back to China, they're then put through a series of internships and you know, perhaps one or two internships outside the family business, and then they'll be put into the family business so that when the child is around 35, 40, they can properly take on the reins of business. You know. Rupert Hugeworth was born in 1970 in Luxembourg, a country only half the size of Shanghai. He was a student in England's prestigious Eton College. Later in 1993, he graduated from Durham University in the UK, majoring in Chinese and Japanese. Coming from one of the smallest countries in Europe, Rupert is writing his own story about finding fortune while spreading his footprints all over China, one of the biggest countries in the world. Tell me about your experience in China when you first arrived years ago. What were your first impressions? I remember being really scared. I arrived at the airport in Beijing and I was thinking, goodness, I've come a long way. Nowadays, when I go back in the summer, they go, my goodness, what great vision. You were <laughs> you smart. Had, you, 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 <laughs> really, you really, yeah, yeah, and, and you of course time. it wasn't planned. You know, yeah. I, was, I was interested in Chinese because I love the Chinese characters. Okay. I love the concept, it's like poetry in 3D. You don't just get the sound and the character in itself, but you get the, the back, the history of the character and how they're all made up together. So I love very I visual, love, visual language. I love the 3D poetry. But now you've seen so many changes in China, haven't you, when you first arrived till now. Tell me about those changes. The single biggest change for me is actually, I can tell the stories. When I first arrived in China, I was at university, I was trying to make Chinese friends. And, you know, one of the things was that I got for dinner with Chinese, with my local friends at university. And it was very difficult because they didn't have enough money to buy any beer, they didn't have any money to buy any, any nice dishes. And, you know, we'd, I was a student at the time and certainly not rich by anybody's standards, but, you know, clearly we had money to, to buy that sort of stuff. Nowadays, You've got my Chinese friends, you know, are traveling all around the world. They can afford to eat everywhere. And as far as sort of the economic gap has been completely reduced, and in fact,